Good morning and welcome to Juma Private Game Reserve here in the middle of the bush. On my way to work this morning, I saw a pack of African wild dog. So we're looking for them right now, and this is Safari Live. Ready. Standing by. Welcome, my name is Brent, and I have the incredible VM on camera. Now, as I was moving from my house, which is on one side of quarantine, to the DRC at about 10 past five this morning, I saw three wild dogs running this way. And uh, of course, for those of you who don't know, African wild dogs are my favorite animal. So we're in a hunt of them right now. And I'm hoping we, we get some luck. Also, congratulations to a bunch of people we managed to see a serval on the Juma cam early this morning. Now keep an eye on that Juma cam for me because the dogs might pop up there. And that's the thing about wild dogs, they move so quickly and in all sorts of directions, you never know where they might pop up. Well, apparently today is actually International Dog Day. So hopefully we'll find wild dogs, I agree. And wouldn't it be fitting to find wild dogs on International Dog Day? We had elephants on International Elephant Day. We had lions on World Lion Day. So it's only fitting that the dogs do their part. Now remember, we are live in the middle of the African bush and we're also interactive. So if you want to send me any questions or comments like Shamsung just did, uh, you can use the email address questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Okay, so while we keep searching for the dogs like a dog with a bone, uh, let's go see how Steph's doing this morning. Good morning, good morning, and yes, it uh, is actually a fine morning this morning, to be quite honest. Just remarked to Brian, who's on camera with me right now, there we go, <laughs> that um, it's, it's smelling good this morning. There's, a, there's this awesome smell in the air, there's this, I, I don't know what it is, I think it's a bit of moisture to be honest with you. We've got this bank of cloud that is rolling in, I'm going to stop and show you rolling in from the Indian Ocean and I think we can smell the moisture associated with this front. Let me show you quickly, get into a nice place where I can actually just turn around here for you. You can see all of that. That was about half what it is now when we started and that was only 20 minutes ago when we started driving around. So from the looks of things, it looks like it's going to be overcast before the end of game drive. Very nice. As you no doubt have seen, Brent came, well, Brent is on the hunt for wild dogs and he came rushing into camp this morning when it was still pitch black, which is unlike Brent. Of course, only something like a wild dog could elicit that type of behavior from him. <laughs> rushed into camp, rushed out of camp, and uh, he's, as he says, like a dog after a bone. Or like a bone after the dog, I should say, is probably the better way of putting it. Um, for me, I'm a little bit more sedate. <laughs> so, good morning, Birdie, all the way from Georgia. You said, what do you think we'll see first today? Ooh, I don't actually know. That's a good question. I mean, obviously, the anticipation of Brent finding dogs is hanging heavy in the air. And I mean, there couldn't be a better person uh, looking for them, to be quite honest. He has that sort of dogged tenacity that is, uh, is, is required to find wild dogs on the move. Um, 
I don't actually know. You know, there was a lot of activity around the camp last night. At quarter to one, something ran past our rooms outside our windows. Um, myself and Kirsty woke up and listened to this crash and commotion. And um, it would seem like something was chasing uh, either a bushbuck or some impala or I don't know what it was past the bedroom. Um, and then there was also a bushbuck making alarm call probably about half an hour after that, also around the camp somewhere. So I'm going to make a few loops around the camp and see what we can find in terms of some tracks. Maybe we find those lions, maybe that mating pair is still around. Perhaps it was those dogs. Maybe Tingana turned around and came back towards the camp last night if he had bumped into those lions. I don't know, but it seems like something along those lines we're going to be finding. So to answer your question, I think one of the predators is going to be first. Um, but you know, time will tell. It could also be one of those mornings that shows much promise but delivers nothing. Um, difficult to say. Anna, you've asked if, well, you've asked all the way from Atlanta, so good evening to you. And um, You've asked, do, are there any nighttime birds that make noises all the time or all night? There are. Um, there absolutely are. There's uh, night jars. Um, night jars are a type of bird that does call the fiery neck night jars calling pretty much the whole night at the moment. Senegal lapwing also have a tendency to fly around at night from place to place and make noises all, the, all night. Um, water dickup, water and spotted dickup, or water and spotted thick knee is the English name. Um, they also make noises all night. What else makes noises all night right now in terms of birds? All your little owls. So pearl spotted owl, scops owl, white faced owl, barred owl. They all make noise at night. Varose eagle owl, that'll make a noise at night. Barn owl, that screeches halfway through the night as well. So a few, more than a dozen, at least anyway. Alrighty, this is Shortcut Gallagher. And one of those roads that just seems to see intense movement of animals backwards and forwards, mainly because it's situated quite close to two quite important water sources, one being Gallagher Pan, off on that side, and Via Telepan, and also it sits at the headway to a couple of these drainage line systems that are in front of us here. And that means that there's very good grass on the verges of these seep lines that you get. But while I turn down here and go and scour this, Brent Leo Smith has an update for you on his wild dog tracking. So we heard some hyena activity in this area around there. So I'm just having a quick look with my binos. Now they could have been interacting with the, the wild dogs. Right, you gotta be quick to catch the dogs. Unfortunately, there are three of us checking. So we're not looking only close by I'm also checking in the in the distance seeing if I can see that sort of magnificently fast moving speck of a wild dog through the bush now if they've chased something they could have changed direction and, and they could go in any direction really exciting. Come on dogs, make an appearance for International Dog Day. Hi 
by uh, Lady Lone Wolf. Uh, Lady Lone Wolf would know to know is there more than one breed of wild dog? Uh, not in Africa. There's only um, it's got a few different names: the Cape Hunting Dog, the Painted Wolf, uh, Lichen Pictus is its scientific name, which means painted wolf. Uh, there is only one breed, and they, they've been separated from domestic dogs or any member of the Canis family for quite some time. And their dentition is different. They've got teeth that are designed to rip, to rip and they've even got an extra toe. And uh, so they've been separate from, from domestic dogs for well over a million years in terms of uh, their evolutionary paths. Uh, there, is, there are other species of wild dogs throughout the world, uh, but only one uh, in Africa. Now, the, probably the most similar in terms of the way they behave and, and hunt, so just listen for a second, is the Indian doe, which is a, a, a wild dog species that occurs in India. So if they are hunting and they get separated, um, they do one of the, my favorite calls in the bush. It's called a woo call. So, what they do is go, ooh, 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 uh, and to try locate each other. Now the other thing I'm listening for is excited, pitched sort of squeaks, bubbles and whistles. That's what they sound like, and that's um, if they've made a kill. checking carefully here see if there are any tracks last track I had was coming in this direction hi Andrew in Vermont Andrew would like to know do the wild dogs have a favorite spot uh, not really uh, they, they tend to move vast distances your average wild dogs pack uh, home range is about 120,000 acres, so they're on the move. The only time they really stay in one spot for a while is when they're denning. But uh, this is a, a dispersal pack, so they haven't bred this year, so it's unlikely that they're going to den. So they just keep bombshelling around. Yeah, so. I'm going to keep searching uh, around this area while we do that. Let's go see how Steph's search is going this morning. Our search is going fine. Thank you very much, Brent. Um, yes, so we've just gone and checked Gary, or Gallego Pan, and there's some lioness tracks and male lion tracks that come to the pan and then turn around and come back out onto this road. So an in and out track. And their tracks leave the road just in front of us and head into this very thick block where they were yesterday morning, or yesterday afternoon in actual fact. So I think they're probably still in here. And I, rather than us bundu bashing inside here and trying to figure out where they are from a game path point of view, I think what I'm going to do is go and circle the block to see if their tracks come out of here at all. So. <laughs> so Andrew, all the way from Vermont, good morning, um, or good evening to you still. Let's, um, I'd also like to see some lions this morning. You just made a comment that you'd love to see some lions. I think it would be a good thing to see lions. I just want to turn the Game Drive channel off. As you know, I get squint-eyed when I have 300 people speaking in my ear about stuff. So I think that these lions are still in here. We did sit with it. We sat for a little bit to, to sit and listen, to hear if we could hear any growling or any vocalization of any sort. And we couldn't hear anything for the two or three minutes that we did sit quietly at the pan listening. But there's no doubt that there was a lot of activity around here last night. And I think to look close to the, 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 the camps here is not going to be the answer. I want to make a quick circle and make sure that they haven't actually crossed out. 
And then what we'll do is we'll start working slowly inwards from there, or I'll just offset it to Herbert. So Jay Atkinson, you've just asked what my opinion is on White Lion. It's actually interesting that you've asked that because it's only really become a topic of interest for me over the last year or so. Um, and I'll tell you why. There were two White Lion cubs born to a pride, a, a natural pride in the Kruger Park, but on the far eastern side of the Kruger National Park about a year and a half ago now. Um, the original White Lions, or the original leucistic lions, in modern times, which is a couple of years ago, a couple of, I don't know exactly the year that it was, but it was in the 1990s or 1980s somewhere, was a pride of lion in the, Kruger, in the Timbavati, just adjacent to the Kruger National Park, and about 40 or 50 miles from here in that direction. And what's happened is because there was such an anomaly, there was such a, a fantastic thing to find, lions were taken out of the Timbavati. I'm not really going to discuss how because I think that they were done nefariously. And white lions were bred because they looked so superb. They, they looked so awesome. And so now what you've got is you've got a very rare, very special natural population of, of white lion and the white lion recessive gene that lives in, in populations of lions in the Kruger National Park. But you also have this breeding programs of white lions, breeding programs and all the negativity that I would like to associate to them, um, that breed these animals for a variety of different reasons. And I, while I don't have a problem with the natural populations of white lions, I've seen a few of them and I, I think that they're absolutely fantastic. The bred white lions, you can see, have been inbred a little bit. Um, and I don't think that there's enough care and attention given to their, uh, to their bloodstock or to their genetic viability or diversity. Um, so how do I feel about it, I suppose, was your actual question. <laughs> um, breeding of white lions, I think, needs to be done with more care. And white lion populations in the Kruger National Park need to be treasured. And you need to come and visit these places and you need to go and see if you can find them. Spend your time and your money in the park to come and have a look for them. Because lion populations are crashing so badly and because it's good to keep money pouring into these conservation areas that harbour these gene pools. Uh, no, I don't think we're going to see that one, Brian. There's a ghost bird, as they like to call it, or the grey-headed bushrike that's calling about 50 or so meters into the bush in that drainage line, but it gets so thick and that bird is so camouflaged, it just wouldn't, we wouldn't even be able to show you. So onward we go to try and pick up any sign we can of this male and female. I expect them to have walked through the middle of this block at some point last night. The only thing that's walked on this road so far has been a hippo. It isn't just fantastic, you know, where does this hippo come from? I know there was a hippo in Bifflesook Dam last night. Could it be the same one? Could it be another hippo from a different area outside of Juma's Traverse that has now come and walked here? Could it be one of the hippos from Sydney's? More than likely, actually. these unanswered questions. Ah, Debbie, you've, you've just asked me a question that I've been asking myself for the last couple of minutes as well. Has that zebra we saw the other day given birth yet? She last was seen walking in exactly this direction, Debbie. And as I was onto this road, I thought to myself, I wonder if we're going to see this pregnant zebra. And I'm definitely going to keep my eyes open for her. Before we do that, though, I just want to show you the fact that these clouds are marching on. It doesn't look like they're going to come over, but we've also got the sun that's going to creep over the top of those clouds. It looks like, I don't know, in a minute or two from here. And we haven't been able to see sunrise yet this morning. Not quite a silver lining, but let's see if it gets more silver as it goes on. 
you can see the rays of sunlight. Well, actually, it's the rays of sunlight being blocked by the clouds, which is causing us to see them come out like radiate out. I just think it's fantastic. And that is as it is, folks. It's as live as, as I'm seeing it and exactly the same colors. I don't know how the witchcraft Brian is doing with his camera at the moment is making it possible for you to see the sky exactly as we're seeing it now. Well done, Mr. Brian. <laughs> his face, a mask of concentration. <laughs> Actually, it's only his eyes are sticking out. He's got a puff on his face. I can't see anything else. I'm imagining the grim determination. <laughs> Have a look at those clouds just marching in. Still nothing getting closer to us. So that bank of clouds that you're seeing is over the Labombo mountain ranges on the other side of the Kruger National Park, on the boundary between South Africa and Mozambique. Uh, that looks like it's just a standing bank of moisture. And to describe the smell that we're smelling this morning, or to describe the aroma in the air, it, it smells like it should be misty. I don't quite know how else to explain it, but there's this, it's quite humid this morning, with a bit of a chill in the air. Not as cold as it was yesterday or the day before, that's for sure. Looks like the sun's coming now. Looks like it wants to burst out the top. Still busy seeing those radial lines of sunlight. Now the sun is actually way above those clouds already. But because we are eight light minutes away from the sun, it's going to take eight minutes for us to see the light coming from the star that is already above those clouds, I would imagine. Look at that. Now it's also giving us a chance while we're waiting for the sun to come up to listen to the bush around us. And that's important because to find a mating pair of lion is sometimes difficult. They don't always move a lot. And it's really only the sound of them mating that allows you to find them very often. I just heard them. Did you hear that? Well, oh, question answered. They're somewhere in front of us. It sounds far away. I'll listen again. I've got a fix on that sound, although my one ear is blocked with an earphone, but I think it's north of us. What's happening to the sun, Mr. Brian? I don't know. Wants to come, but it's just not... Okay, we got the lions roaring <laughs> behind us. Just hold on one sec. Our stations there, we got vocalization, lions, Gallego Pan, Gallego Pan. So, it's rather embarrassing because it was my job to check Gallego Pan and now these lions are roaring from right there. <laughs> And it sounds like the whole pride is there as well. There was more than one lion that was roaring. Come on, son, what are you doing? These banks of clouds are just growing faster than what the sun is rising, actually. Look at that coming out the bottom. So one second, of course I've created confusion on this radio now that needs to be sorted out. Here comes the sun, look at that. Oh, that is a beautiful sunrise. I 
I don't quite know which direction the sun is actually shining there. I think it's actually above the... No, there it comes. I can see it now peeking over the top at the bottom. I mean, that's just like a hole in the clouds that is just becoming intense. Is that the sun or is that just the clouds burning at the bottom? Yeah, I think the sun is coming there. Yeah, so difficult to actually see. Just look at that epic sunrise though. It is, that is very awesome. You can see the clouds above us now starting to catch the first rays of those sun. Got some mahinas now that I can hear probably about two or a mile or two away. There's the sun coming up bottom right of that hole in the clouds. There we go. Eventually, gee whiz. Well done, Mr. Brian. A majestic sunrise for you this morning. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, I get your point. We'll go and find the lions. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for reminding me what my actual job is, and that's to find and show you animals. So, <laughs> all right. Here we go, Mr. Bryant. Excuse me on the radio, just for a second. I just got to... The stations, excuse me, I was just live for a while. Uh, the audio I had was of lion vocalizing around Gallego Pan. I am on Gallego Shortcut following up. All right. While I slowly make my way there, which should be exactly the opposite of how Brent would approach this particular uh, exercise. <laughs> We're going to send you across to him to find out what he's been up to tracking those wild dogs. So we found the dog tracks. It seems like they've cut a bit further to the north towards Sandy Patch. They went off the power lines. So now we are moving, as they said, quite quickly around the opposite side. We're going to slow down shortly uh, to see, hopefully, we get a view of them popping through the bush. They do move so incredibly quickly. Just hyena tracks so far. Morning, Karen in Sacramento. Karen would like to know where do the wild dogs come from and what do they eat? Well, Karen, uh, wild dogs are an indigenous species to most of sub Saharan Africa in your uh, savanna zones, and uh, they are the second most endangered canid or dog species in Africa. Only about four and a half thousand left in the wild. And uh, they eat small to medium-sized antelope, impala, kudu, waterbuck, anything like that. Let's have a look here for tracks again. Lots of hyena tracks. Okay, I'm just going to check a little bit further up this way. Um, so, Karen, wild dogs evolved in Africa about two million years ago. Um, they split from the common ancestor of the, the domestic dog, the wolf. And uh, they've developed into in, incredible, incredible hunters with amazing stamina. Oh, just listen to that. And uh, they can do about 60 kilometers an hour and keep up that speed for quite a few kilometers. I don't see any tracks here now, so check back down towards Aubrey's Road. Now, while we're looking for the dogs, I got some news on some cats. Um, uh, Tingana's tracks, unfortunately, he's vacated our property. And uh, I heard a very, I got I told a very interesting story that'll set a lot of your, oh, 
a hot and flatter about little Shung Gile. She nearly lost her life yesterday afternoon uh, to the south of us. Uh, she chased after something which uh, she might have assumed was a squirrel or a scrub hare. It was a baby baboon. And then the whole troop of baboons, the males, came through to attack her. But fortunately for little Shongile, her mother is quite a fierce cat. And Karula apparently jumped in and defended her and gave her an opportunity to escape and nearly got hurt by the baboons herself. So that happened just to the south of us. They didn't see Hosanna, so I'm pretty sure uh, he's fine though, but he might not have been right there. And with the pandemonium caused by something like the boons, oh. There's a nest. Do you see it, Ben? Okay, you see this where this tree expired a long time ago. And I'll go into that little section there. Um, a little bit to the right. Look at that. Look at that for camouflage. That is that little Senegal lapwing nest. So I just saw mom, mom stand up. So a ground nesting bird's nest. And you can see how incredible that camouflage is. If I didn't see mom stand up, I wouldn't have seen those eggs. There's mom there. Senegal lapwing. For those of you who still know the old names of birds, a lesser black winged plover, if I remember correctly. But we're still, I was hoping the dogs would pop out into this open area. So, as much time as we do spend with Karula and the cubs and other things, lots of stuff happens when we're not there. And those prob cubs have probably nearly lost their life multiple times. <coughs> and uh, one must remember that is natural. Uh, if all the predators, all their cubs got to adulthood all the time, there'd be too many predators. Come on, puppies. Now, Tony's wondering what came first, wild dogs or wolves? Um, I think they came about co co concurrently, but uh, it's a set of different arms off the, the evolutionary tree. They're just elephant tracks here. Now, something like elephant could also change a wild dog's direction <coughs> rather than run right up to the alleys, they might go around them. We've seen elephants chase wild dogs many, many times. Their tracks were heading straight west. They're now wondering if they, they might have cut back to the north. There's a couple of spots here that the wild, we've seen the wild dogs cross quite a few times. Aubrey's Road's always a firm favorite. Hyena tracks. Now, Steph's asking, why do lapwings always seem to nest right next to the road? Well, they don't, Steph. Those are just the ones we're actually able to spot. Um, but the, the roads quite often utilize those short grass areas where we want to look for uh, animals. So we, we put ourselves in good lapwing nesting country. Oh, 
wants that. Okay, here we go. Here are the tracks again. Going that way. At least one here. We have tracks of two over there. Okay, time to turn around. What do you think? Sandy patch, Vim? Yeah? Sydney's? There's taxes there. Oh, no sign of them. Standing by. Look. There's wild dog done right here on top of the hyena dung. I see them. Tax, I've just got more cons on now um, on Wirtilla Access, Aubrey's Junction. I'm just trying to figure uh, direction. So that's not uncommon. Wild dogs often defecate on top of hyena dung. Oh dear. It sounds like they might have got ahead of us and crossed to the west into Simbambili. But we'll keep checking. Only tracks of one. Make sure they didn't go down Aubrey's, doesn't look like it. Uh, hopefully the dogs haven't managed to avoid us on International Dog Day. We're going to keep checking. So while we do that, uh, let's jump back on a board with Steph and see how his hunt for the cats are going. Welcome back with us. Our hunt for the cats is so far unsuccessful. They're in this massively thick block that uh, they were in yesterday. I'm almost sure of it. But what we are going to do is go down this little game path here. Brian has a feeling that they're closer to this game path and it wouldn't hurt for us to actually take a drive down there because I also actually think they're lying somewhere between us and them. We've got the tracks going over here. You can see on that game path there you will see the tracks coming down to the pan. There's one, yep, on it. That's a big male's tracks. So they're definitely here. So now the question is to try and find them. I'm not going to spend too long over here, to be honest. I'm going to be calling in. <laughs> so Jason, you just asked me if the two lion prides successfully raise all their cubs, are we likely to have a lion war? Um, Jason, probably not. I'll, I'll tell you the reason why is that um, lions, let's just switch off here and have a listen. Lions have a set number of adult females that live in an area. And so what will happen is when you have a drastic decline in lion numbers like we did with this pride takeover, generally speaking, most of the cubs that are born are females with some males. But as the pride starts to swell, as the, as the, the numbers of lions reach this carrying capacity, for lack of a better word, the females will start to have more male cubs than females. The, why is that? It's because the male cubs start to become nomadic. And so... There'll be a given number of lions, adult female lions in any one area with a, with a, a variable number of cubs. <clears throat> and as they grow to fill this niche where they are in, the male lions will start to shed off. The male lions become nomadic and move away and start and take over prides of their own in other areas. Um, so I don't think that there'll be a lion war here. I mean, we, look, we probably will lose one or two cubs along the way for whatever reason. 
Um, and the male cubs will leave, and I think what we'll quickly find out is that the Incahumas, I'm not too sure exactly what their carrying capacity is, I haven't been in this area for that long, but it'll probably be somewhere between six and eight adult females, somewhere around there, I suppose. Um, and when they start to get to these six or eight adult females, they will have lots of babies. The pride might swell to 20, 25 lion. It's not uncommon to have prides of up to 30 lion, cubs included in this particular place. But the amount of adult females will always be a set amount of female. Um, and then you've got the sticks lioness who have exactly the same dynamic, so to say, where there will be a fixed number of females, adult females in the sticks lioness territory. So these lions will move in this territory and they'll be able to perform in this territory. Males will come and go, cubs will come and go, but they won't be a war for territory, so to say. That happens between lions, male lions. Male lions will fight one another for dominance over an area that contains females. A slightly different, there's an overlap there, but male lion dynamics are different to female lion dynamics. Female lions are hereditary to an area, they stay in the area where they're born, and successive generations of females will roll through the ages through that particular area. Who knows how many years the Nkuhumas have actually held sway over here. It would be such a fascinating exercise to do a lineology exercise if, if genetic material was available for so long to see for how many generations, how many dozens of years, perhaps how many even hundreds or even thousands of years the Nkuhuma females have had this particular patch of bush. Whereas for males, they will come in, they will take over an area, they will dominate the females in that area, they will be allowed to mate to those females, they will join those females at meals, they will they'll have protection, they'll look after their cubs, but they actually operate on a completely different plane, um, a completely different dynamic. So what we're hearing for here, or what I've stopped to listen for here, is any noise of those lines. They are there somewhere, if I had to put my fingers on it, <coughs> inside that tangle of bush. And what I think is going to be the easiest to do is actually to call Herbert and ask Herbert to go inside there and go and find them rather than me going in there and finding them. We've got some vultures. Hey, we've got some vultures. Let's go forward a little bit so that you can see that vulture. There we go. Yes, we have some vultures. Well done, Mr. Brian. A vulture standing at the top of... Here's Herbert, he comes as if called. <laughs> He's obviously had enough of my incompetence. Oh, sorry, my hand was in the fray there. He's actually had enough of my incompetence, and he's moved into the area to come and give us a hand, which is a good thing. That is a white-backed vulture. And then Brian say there's a tree full of vultures a little bit further on. <coughs> Good morning, Herbie. How are you? Good. We are live at the moment, so I'm going to be sharing this story with all of, all of us. Um, so I was on Shortcut Gallego, and I heard the lions roaring in here somewhere. Tracks that I've tra found around the pan are just going to the pan. I didn't find where they went back again. Um, but yeah, if you wouldn't mind giving us a hand, it's going to be difficult to pick. Let's go to Herb's if we can. So you can see what Herbert looks like in the, this morning. Hold on, we're going to come and say hello to you, Mr. Herbert. <laughs> so there's a track here, but this was from last night. The fresher tracks come out onto the... <laughs> there we go. That's Herbert. His beautiful smile again in his tracking vehicle. <laughs> Yes. They s okay. They sound almost like they're in exactly the same place they were yesterday. I would imagine. Cool. Can I reverse my car past you? Thanks, Evie. All right. So Herbert has kindly offered to find these lines for us while we carry on looking for other interesting things. 
Herbie, I would. I don't know where the fresh tracks left you. I would imagine that they're somewhere here, yeah. but they sounded like they were lying here somewhere close by. Okay, cool. All right. See you just now. <laughs> Try not to get eaten if you can. All right, everybody, that's Herbert. Going to go do his thing for us. I'm very, very thankful that we have him. Thank you, Herbie. So 40 Odd has just asked me what happens to the overthrown males and that's actually a very, very good question 40 Odd and the reason for that is that up until I started here and watched the Birmingham boys take over the, the Matembas, which were the two dominant, the Birmingham boys are the coalition that now holds sway in this area and the Matembas are the males that were deposed here. And up until I had watched this particular pride takeover happen, I would have said that the deposed males are usually either injured and move off or are moved off into other male lion's territories that are also younger and stronger than what they are and eventually they are killed. That is, was my understanding and my experience up to this point. Um, but what's happened is a couple of years ago, a coalition of male lions moved into the Sabi Sand Game Reserve from the Kruger National Park and killed a lot of lions. They killed a lot of male lions, they killed a lot of female lions, and they left a male lion void here. And it's taken many years for this male lion void to be filled, and it's only now starting to be filled. So what happened was the two male lions that were dominant here were kicked off by these five young, at the time they were five, there are now four of them. And all that these male lions did was just shifted a little bit out of their territory into a territory that didn't have male lions. And they were still young enough and still strong enough to fight off the peripheral males, which had too much area to cover for what they, what they could cover effectively. And they now live quite happily on the Sand River. As far as I understand, the Matimba Coalition, which is made up of Hairy Belly and some other male lion, I can't really remember his name off the cuff here, but excuse me? Oh, no, sorry. Oh, Hairy Belly and Ginger. Sorry, I'm just getting Kirsten to help me with my lion names here. Made up of, uh, of the two male lions. They now live on the Sand River. And they're living quite happily. Last time I heard anything about them, they were swallowing a hippo while, uh, while relaxing next to the river and the burbling brook with the sun over their heads. So it's not necessarily true that male lions that are or deposed get killed in the fight. They might just give up like these Matimbas did uh, and move into an area that doesn't have any females or any real overlap of males. So it was, it's been quite interesting for me to, to actually experience that over, the, over this last year and something alien to what I know and to what I understand as lion behavior. Those clouds have almost completely burnt off, can you believe it? It's going to be another beautiful day. So what we're going to do is we're just going to circle this block. We don't want to get too far away from Herbert. Um, the reason being is that he might actually need our help um, in, in trying to find these lions. He's got some fresh tracks on that game path that we were parked on. The lion tracks were going into the bush. Hopefully he'll find them fairly quickly. Hopefully they'll be in an area that we can actually access with the cars. I, uh, I've walked lots in this area and apart from Brentley O'Smith, no other human being on this planet could get in there. But anyway, on the Brentley O'Smith saga, he is probably dying to update you on what's been happening to the tracks and the tracking of those wild dogs. So off you go to him and we'll catch up in a little bit. So tracks of those wild dogs have crossed into Arethusa, so, so have we. Um, we're heading now towards Red Dam on a bit of a hunch. And uh, so I thought I saw something through there. Let's just check here quickly. Okay, let's go have a look. So they could be coursing through this area. It's a good area. There's, oh.
Okay, not important that update. So there's a couple of people helping me look for these wild dogs now. And I've let the guys know in Arethusa that we're coming across. And uh, I'm hoping that they maybe went towards Red Dam, which is just down here. So we're gonna check Southern Fork down to Red Dam, see if there are any tracks. If there are no tracks there, that means they're still between the boundary and where we are. Now, come on dogs, it's International Dog Day. You have to make an appearance. Hi, Michael. Michael, who's 18, would like to know what would happen if these three dogs ran into one of the bigger packs, say the Sands pack or the Investec pack. Would they kill or ignore? It all depends. Often they will actually try fight, and, and actually, this, uh, the Sands pack killed one of the Investec pack last year. So sometimes they'll fight. Uh, normally what will happen is the smaller pack, being just three animals, will try to skedaddle out of there as fast as possible. Oh, bounce, bounce. So I'm, I'm sort of not expecting to find tracks on this road. I think those dogs are really kept around the Murakani River. Uh, there's no road in that section. Sorry, it just uh, looks like a drag mark on the road. It's quite hard here. There's lots of elephant tracks. Yeah, it's Ellie's. Uh, William's wondering why did the wild dogs defecate on top of the hyena dung? Um, I don't know, maybe it's a bit of a dominance thing. I've seen them do it often. Um, but that particular spot, sorry William. Just need to have a look at this track and some softer soil. Okay, sorry about that William. Uh, we're back. Now, uh, it's probably just a dominance thing. Uh, I've seen them do it many, many times, defecate on top of hyena dung. It's sort of like, haha, I am on top, I am therefore the better. Sean, Sean? I'm sorry. Sean, um, has anyone checked Red Dam yet? Okay, copy. Um, I think I'll just keep, I'll keep heading towards Sibambili Cup line then. Okay, copy. I'll check Red Dam quickly and then I'll come back up towards uh, the western sectors. Okay, so there were some tracks around here but still heading west. So we're going to check Red Dam in case they went there for uh, the water. Hi, Chloe. Uh, Chloe is in Illinois, and uh, Chloe would like to know how many dogs are in a pack normally. Uh, Chloe, they can vary from 2 to 40. <laughs> so it's very, very uh, dependent on how successful their breeding has been. So how new wild dog packs are formed is generally one, sometimes two members of the same sex will disperse from their natal pack and basically run around till they meet another two members of the opposite sex who've dispersed from their natal pack. So, and this normally, uh, that's one way a pack is formed. Uh, the other way uh, is if a pack gets very big, uh, 40, 50, and it does happen from time to time, then they'll just split. Whereas it's so difficult to keep all the pack members fed.
Now, Dark Tranquility is wondering how hyenas feel about wild dogs. Well, they actually quite like them because uh, wild dogs, they don't have massively powerful jaws. So what happens is they, they leave quite a lot of the carcass behind and the hyenas in, cert, in certain parts of Africa, uh, what they do is they will literally just follow the packs um, while they're in their territory and just scavenge off. Wild dogs have quite a, def a successful defense mechanism against um, hyenas. Oh, there's a fish eagle. He's flying off. No sign of uh, the dogs, though. Let's head back to the west. So uh, they have very su successful um, defense mechanisms against hyenas and uh, the hyenas will often put up with uh, quite a severe, what looks like quite a severe beating uh, from dogs biting them. They normally bite them on the bottom and what a hyena will often do is basically reverse into a thick bush so it keeps the front gnashes uh, out to defend itself against the dogs. It's very, very unusual that the dogs ever do any serious damage to something like a hyena. Now the biggest threat to wild dogs is of course the lions and uh, lions are probably the biggest killers of wild dogs, wild dog puppies uh, out of all the animals we get out chat. So we're going to keep on the hunt. I'm really hoping these dogs haven't moved all the way west and outside of our Travis area. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to shoot right to our western boundary and then work my way back east. Wait, just hang on a second. What's that? Before we disappear. Oh, look at that. It's a kukul. Oh, there you go. There you go. A Birchall's, oh no, sorry, white browed or Birchall's kukul. Looks like a Birchall's skulking off. I haven't seen one of those in a while, have you? Now, nicknamed the rainbird, maybe that's why we haven't seen them for so long. There's been no rain. Okay, we're going to keep heading to the west and then we're going to jump back and work our way back east. Hopefully we have some luck with those dogs uh, while we do that. Uh, let's uh, see what Steph's got. It's not quite a lion, but definitely close enough. It has a heartbeat. And this is an Impala ram on his own, which is unusual to be quite honest. Impala rams are generally this time of the year with other Impala rams and almost always in close association with females and he's not. He's a mature ram in very good condition. All fuzzed up against the cold and you can see that almost reddish tinge that he has to that patch of hair or that band of darker colored hair that goes across his back. You can almost see that fuzz that, that, that I'm talking about. Those are the erectile muscles that each hair is attached to has, have, are standing up and that's just to slow the passage of air down across his body and give his body heat a chance to warm up that cushion of hair. Similar to how I, our hairs stand up although obviously much more effective and it gives them this brushed look like somebody's taken a comb and brushed them the wrong way. His whole body's actually, the hair standing up. <laughs> Although to be honest, with lions roaring around the area, I'd also have every hair on my body standing up if I was an impala. He's been nibbling at the grass, really just picking up, I'm seeing if he's nibbling up leaves or grass, but he's actually chewing grass. It's a very good area this actually for um, for grass. I've walked here in summer and the, the water literally leaks out of the ground here. And I think that the best grass is here which probably explains why he's here on his own. He's clever enough to know exactly which food is good for him and which isn't. Now on my eternal quest to find a weeping boar bean with flowers. In the background there's another very healthy weeping boar bean and I'm busy having a look with my binoculars now to see if I can see a red tinge to it. And you can see there just above the impala in the background there's this green tree. 
and that is exactly the green tree and you can see there very clearly there's no reddish tinge to that to that tree whatsoever so while a healthy boer bean that hasn't got any flowers I'm gonna say I'm not giving up but what I'm gonna say is it's probably a bit early to start looking for weeping boer beans this week and we'll have to try again next week The good thing is, is that I've now marked the healthiest trees that I know of in this particular area and it's going to be easy to keep almost a daily check on them. Dawn chorus of birds still continuing. So, Chris, um, all the way from Vancouver, wow that is far away from where we are here. Uh, you've asked me, do we get honeybees in the area? Absolutely, Chris. We absolutely get honeybees in the area. Funnily enough, though, last year I didn't see one hive. Not even one. Did you see a hive last year, Brian? Didn't see any hives last year. But they are fairly common out here, Chris. Um, and although we, we, we do seem to have no bees around at the moment, generally in, in wetter years, our camps are just flooded by bees because of the availability of fruit and everything else. But this year we've had none. I wonder if that is a sign or not. We'll keep an observation on that. Thanks for, for reminding me on that actually. That's an interesting point. Where have all the honeybees gone? They, like almost any other animal, need water to build or to mix in with the nectar that then eventually distills itself to honey. So they are water dependent. It's just such a peaceful vista this. Impala, green tree, bird chorus. I'm hearing some Dwarf mongoose making their alarm calls at something. The impalas actually reacted to the dwarf mongoose making an, an alarm call. Alright, and I think it's time for us to move on. Carry on going. Goodbye, Mr. Impala. Thank you. So Greg, you've just made a comment that you've uh, just found us three years ago and you've been addicted to this particular show. Well, I for one am going to welcome you again. Welcome to the family, welcome to the Wild Earth and Safari Life family. Um, ah, there's also a water buck there. Um, and you've asked how many years has the Safari Life product been on the go? I think it's since 2007. Although I stand to be corrected, um, but since 2007, Greg, we've been going and mainly operating out of Juma, although there was a short stint that we went to, I think, Thorny Bush. But since 2007, we've been going. So a few years now doing these types of safaris. And as the rest of our community will no doubt enlighten you, it's we are a far cry today from where we started off, very humble beginnings. Lots of technical things to get over and pioneer, but since then we've managed to weather every storm and we have what we have today. That is a water buck's bottom that we're having a look at there, I promise. <laughs> you can just see the tips of his horns on the right hand side of that greyish blob. There we go. <laughs> that termite mound is a water buck. All through the sticks. And let's carry on, let's carry on. Not the best sight of a water buck into the sun through the sticks. All right, we're still busy circling this block, waiting to hear what Herbert has to say about those lion tracks. I know what he's doing. He's probably tracking them footprint for, for footprint very gingerly because the blocks are very thick.
Lynn, you've just asked me what the weeping bourbon flowers smell like. I can't actually remember. It's actually been a bit of time since I've smelt a weeping bourbon flower. I generally just enjoy what, uh, looking at them and all the birds and insects that they, uh, that they attract. I don't actually know. That's a good question. I can't remember the smell whatsoever. <laughs> uh, Chloe, in Illinois, good morning Chloe, you just asked me how common are tree diseases in this area? Chloe, I have very, very little knowledge on tree diseases. What I can say though that it, fungal infections here are very common amongst the trees here and very often we'll have trees that fall down and die due to a fungus infection that they get from when elephant or another animal scrapes their bark off or a storm breaks their branch off. They get fungus and borer beetles um, that infest the wood, eat out the, the core of the tree and then the tree falls over in the next storm or when it gets rubbed against by, a, by, a, by another animal. So they do have fungus here and I think that's probably what I know about trees and what I've seen at least from trees. Between fungus and borer beetles, they have the most devastating effect on the trees. And then of course, the other disease that trees have here are probably elephant. Elephant have been knocking down trees here non-stop basically. For the last couple of months while this drought has been in force and there hasn't been too much grass to eat. We're hoping that that breaks soon. In the next couple of months, it's predicted that it's going to be a wettish year and with that comes all the grass and all the rejuvenation of the bush and the elephant will then stop smashing down trees and will hopefully start to eat more grass and give these trees time to recover themselves. Alrighty, now we've now crossed to an area where I know that game path that Herbert was on comes out. That game path comes out where we are now and I've been stopping and listening and driving and stopping and listening for some time now and there's no tracks of these lions on the floor here there's also no sign of them so they obviously not moving so I would imagine that just given enough time Herbert is going to give us a call and tell us that he's found the lions or they have found him. And if it's doable to drive in there, then we'll go and see them. Just hold on, Susan. I'm going to answer your question now. Herbie's calling me. Yeah, go, Herbert. Go with your message. I'll be with you now, Susan. Copy that. Be there in a couple of minutes. Thank you. All right. So Herbie says I must come and join him at the pan, which can only mean one thing. Something has walked out of the bush and gone to the pan. So Susan, you've just asked me, um, have I ever seen an African golden cat? No, I haven't, Susan. I haven't seen an African golden cat. I've only seen pictures of them and they look fantastic. Here we get something a little bit similar. We get a caracal here. And, um, and, uh, and although not 100% the same, they're the same size with the same sort of reddish coat. Um, I'd love to see an African golden cat. If I'm not mistaken, they occur in Ethiopia. Although, please feel free to, uh, to update me on that. Um, all right, so as you can see, I'm driving at my top speed roughly half the top speed or a third of the top speed that friend Brent reaches an eighth Brian says <laughs> this is about as fast as I, I can handle out here sick <laughs> even Kirsty says I'm driving too slowly so while we get to Herbert at the pan he hasn't told me what's there just yet um, I would presume that it's the lion hopefully it is we're going to send you over to Brent so that you can enjoy his company while I speed through the bush here and see what Herbie's found for us. 
So we had tracks in the Murakani riverbed, probably about a kilometer from here. So we left the tracks, we've zoomed to our southern boundary on Arethusa, and we're moving back sort of northeast at the moment with our fingers crossed that uh, they haven't managed to sneak past us. Now, fortunately, this area is quite open, so even if they are far from the road, there's a good chance we're going to spot them. Come on, puppies! Hi, Justin, and Justin says, because it's International Dog Day, uh, have I ever had a dog? Justin, I've had many dogs over my life. Uh, I don't have one currently uh, because of where I'm living and moving around a lot. Uh, so it would be unfair for me to have a pet when I couldn't actually put enough time into it. So uh, I think the first dog I can remember that was mine, not a family dog, was a, a dog that <laughs> I named Gummy Bear, after the Gummy Bears, yes. Uh, it was a Rottweiler cross Doberman, if I remember correctly. And she was very sweet, she used to let us ride her. And then we've, I've had uh, another dog, we didn't know what to name it, so we named it Angaz which is the Zulu word for I don't know. And that was a Great Dane cross um, with uh, Burbul, which is a, an African Mastiff, which were originally bred, bred for hunting lions. And then uh, after that, we had quite a few Burbuls, um, or Burbul Mastiff crosses. Uh, the biggest one was my last dog. Uh, its name was Doofus. And uh, Doofus was a massive female burble, probably weighing about 70 kilograms. And uh, beautiful, beautiful dog. And then uh, as a family, we've had lots of different dogs. We've had uh, Bull Terriers, Jack Russells. Uh, my mother loves Jack Russells. Uh, she's still got one at the moment, and that's called Nunu. And the one before that was Ho Ho, uh, which are both little names for bugs because they're small. And uh, what else have we had? We've had uh, pointers, um, uh, street dogs that were rescues, and let's have a look. I'm really hoping to the last dog tracks were not far from here. They might. I didn't see anything on the on the on the southwestern side, so maybe they're headed a bit further west. Maybe they caught something. Now, one of the funniest dog stories I know, and not wild dogs, uh, but uh, domestic dogs. So I grew up in a little town on the edge of the Okavango Dalsa called Mound. Uh, just one second. Uh, Sean, are you looking for me? Sorry, Sean, not copying you. Okay, well, we'll wait for Sean to get hold of me again. And so there was a lady who will remain nameless who imported uh, these very fancy French poodles that had the hairdo and the pom-poms and all that nonsense. And uh, what happened was uh, quite often during the winter months in Maon, there's a lot of donkeys, they're more donkeys than people. And uh, they, quite a few of them die during the dry season. And uh, 
this lady's very fancy white French poodles escaped the fence and were behaving like proper wild dogs getting stuck inside the donkey carcass with all the village dogs. And uh, she was very surprised. But of course, it doesn't matter how much we fluff and plump and, and snip and make dogs look how we want them. If there's a piece of rotting meat there, that dog's going to be in it. Sean, Sean. Sorry, Sean, I couldn't copy your last message. Negative, I checked down to the southern boundary. I had no luck there. Um, the last tracks were in the Murray Kent, so I'm coming um, along Road 7 now, and they keep checking back towards the east. Um, I don't know, maybe they went south. Uh, I'll check there next. Sorry about that. Uh, but there we go. Dogs will be dogs, and I will continue to search for them. And while we do that, let's go to Steph and a surprise. And true to form, Herbert, with all the skill of an inexperienced tracker, found these lions at Gallego Pan and called us in. And there we have some of the youngest members of this pride. Oh, they're cute. I must be honest, there's very few things that move a person as much as seeing these cubs or cubs of this particular size. So Herbert tells me that he walked into the lions, all of them together, at in this block, exactly where we thought they were going to be. And um, they all ran away from him. And they all ran to this place and then have come out of the bush here. And they don't look scared at all. I mean, these lions, in all honesty, have had people around them for quite some time. And although terrified of people on foot and can be quite scary if, if, if you walk into them on the wrong day. They tend to settle down quite, my point is they tend to settle down after a scare. Some lions that I've walked into the Kruger stay alert for ages. I'm gonna go just around these lions so that we've got them drinking. I'm gonna scare these babies. I'm gonna take a bit of a wide loop try and come into them from the other side and get them drinking. Do you want the sun? Where, Brian? Alex, you've just asked me how do lions stay warm in winter? That's a good question, Alex. They do shiver the same as what we do. They also have that quite thick fur and they lie on top of one another as well. Have a look at this fantastic sight. Look at that little baby, doesn't need to drink any water in actual fact. They get all their, all their fluid needs from mom, but they will drink when water is available. Look at the rest of the pride coming up here. Dust around their feet. Lovely. Yeah. Should I go forward a bit more, Brian? Yeah, we can. 
We're gonna go forward a little bit more. We're gonna get this big male coming down to drink as well. I think it's gonna make for some spectacular shots for you. Get the sun 100% out. Herbie, Herbie is the bomb, Margaret. I agree 100% with you. Have a look at this. Get your, gu get your screen grabs ready. Now, I'm not speaking just because it's so interesting to listen to them drink. There's nothing wrong with the sound. Oh, it smells skinny. They haven't eaten in a few days. These little cubs, obviously oblivious to the needs of the pride in terms of security and food. And they're just reveling in the fact that they have surrounded by lots of playmates. <laughs> that tail swishing there. <laughs> there we go. Exhibiting just exactly what cubs do. That play fighting, skills that are so important to learn as they get older. The one in the tree jumping down. Little mock charge. Now comes some help. Just to give everybody an update on the radio. The stations there in Kumuma, in Kumuma Pride have now moved east away from Gallagher Pan down towards the riverbed. Um, visual of just the tail end of the cubs. I'm in the area. You're more than welcome to join. It's just myself, no one else on approach yet. Copy that. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, when you get here, please, if you wouldn't mind taking over the lock, uh, just from an administration point of view. So now this little cub. Most of the cubs are heading away. Mom is now coming back to fetch them. Look at this little cub on the left-hand side hunting this dove. So some doves gave this little cub a fright. Although the doves are now walking away from him, he was stalking. See the ones in the tree on the left hand side, bro? That is such an awesome picture, that.
that Oh no, it is such an awesome sight in that sort of picture that you're just watching there now appeals to me, action on all sides. Little cubs just run down there now. What I don't want to do is start my car. There's one little cub that was hunting the dove. He's now would be cut off if I moved toward those cubs. So I think what I'm gonna do is just wait here and see what happens. Mom came back out of the shadows. To call them but they don't seem to be paying her any mind whatsoever it's just cubs sort of littered across this open area here there he goes he's gonna come and join his friends in the tree let's see what they do to him they'll probably try and hunt him to some effect or another ambush him from the side of the bush yes you can see them go down <laughs> there you go <laughs> and watch the other one ambushing going flat on the left hand side of the path you can just see the outline of the head there in the grass that is just thousands of years worth of lion behavior Shamsung, yes, you've just made a, a, a comment that they remind you of Tigger, the way they bounce around there. I have no doubt that someone watched lion cubs at a point and then modeled and then modeled these cartoon characters on them. There's sometimes the likeness is uncanny that they can generate from those early cartoon characters. Oops. <laughs> Embarrassed. Running off. <laughs> all right now we have got our work cut out for us trying to get into that place i must be honest it's not going to be the easiest finding out where these cubs have slept all right so i think while i figure out exactly where these lions are going to hole up for the day it would be a good idea to send you through to brent he's got an update on what he's been busy with Bad news. Wild dogs were too fast even for them and myself this morning. They have crossed out of our Travis area. So I'm slowly going to head down to the south and go have a look for Queen Karula. See if those baboons didn't chase her. Take one last camera. If the baboons didn't chase her uh, back to the north yesterday. Now, I told that story for those of you who might be logging in a little late. Uh, last night or yesterday evening, uh, little Shongile chased a baby baboon into the middle of the troop and nearly got killed. Huh? Male leopard tracks. Oh. Uh, hyenas. Uh. Let's have a quick look. I see hyenas. Have we over there? A hippopotamus and hyena. Oh, VM. It's not often VM gets a track wrong. It's the disappointment of those wild dogs escaping us, I think. Ah, oh, there we go. The excuses are coming. The exact same size as the male leopard. Uh, but so we're going to head down to that area, see if we can have a, a squiz around for the queen of Juma. Maybe she's moved north. Uh, the baboons seem to be spending a lot of time around the Mawati sleeping and uh, that's where she got chased. So Shungile ran off after a baby baboon. Karula actually had to run in and charge the baboons uh, to stop them from hurting her cubs. So it might be a good idea to go see if they've maybe moved away from uh, the, the southern areas and up into the north. But it is an exquisite morning and uh, lovely light and I would never be one to deny you 
your cub cuteness overdose uh, of the Inkahumas with Steph. So let's have a look. There we go. Found these cubs. They are now trying to catch up with mom. They're not holding back anymore. Not like they were at the pan. They're now right on top of one another. Still quite boisterous. Male lion still making his way through the mess of cubs. Just two more cubs left. This one at the back is already showing behavior reminiscent of, or not reminiscent, but behavior similar to that that they'll exhibit when they're older. This reluctance to want to be close to mom and on their own. dangerous for a little cub to be left behind this far. The reason for that is that cubs that get left behind and are not, and are not secured get gobbled up by a hyena and killed by leopard and wild dog very quickly. Sorry, bro. Should I make sure that he's not behind us. Big male lying there. Let's see if they give him some nonsense. They're fumbling Hansi. They're fumbling. Here comes a big female at the ground. Right, I just have to. Whoa, 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 what's going on here? Wow. Males, obviously, his irritation levels are at a super high at the moment for some other odd reason. He just had to force that female into a very submissive behavior there. He... So that happens sometimes when male lions are trying to... Thank you. Hello. That happens sometimes when male lions are trying to assert dominance, when they're feeling a little bit of pressure for whatever reason. And need to try and assert their dominance over the females. I'm not a hundred percent sure exactly what elicited that. I wasn't looking at what that female did, but I think what she did was she came up too close behind him. Have a look at that. That what you're looking at there is just dominance behavior. That it look, what it looked like mating. It looked like an attempted covering, but it wasn't. It's just literally just lions just being lions. They are just ruled by this compulsion to dominate. Good morning. How are you? Good. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Good. So we are joined by Taxon and Aubrey in the sighting with us. What do you think they're going to do, Mr. Brown? you think they're going to cross that drainage line? I think they are heading down there. The one female, she's still in view there. She doesn't look like she's keen on following this male anywhere. Hmm, where to go? These females and the cubs are not going down into the drainage line. They're just staying on this little island. I'm actually just keen on just waiting right here just for a bit, just to see exactly what their plan is. So 
And they've got some of these cubs, they haven't gone down. I think they're this female's cubs. There. They're coming back to her now. As you saw from that male and female lion interaction, cubs can sometimes be caught in that, that general uproar and be given a smack unintentionally that does some damage. And it definitely isn't uncommon for male lion to kill cubs unintentionally, even their own ones. Okay, so she's now walking down there. Some line action here. Brian, you think we can squeeze through that gap there? I think so. I'm going to give it a bash. Mm. Let's see if we can squeeze through that gap. Well, just bear with us. I'm going to try and do it as quietly as I can. For all as quiet as I can be in a 4,000 pound car. That seemed pretty painless. <laughs> All right, now what I don't want to do is drive straight at a lion. The headlights of this car resemble eyes, and with a male lion that's as edgy as what that one is, you don't want to intimidate them any more than what you have to. And I think this is close enough for these two cubs, I don't know where the rest of the lions are. I think they're lying in the shade. Yeah, they're lying in the shade just in front of us. You can see mom in the distance there. That's a little cub. Isn't that face just fantastic? Still got this male lion growling, I think. Look at this little one. He's now going to come and chew the stick a bit. Mother's not wanting to nurse that little baby, and so he was just disciplined. Now he's moaning. <laughs> Upset with love. At this stage, their teeth have erupted, and it's actually quite painful for the mom to suckle. Quite, quite often at this particular stage, Female lions bleed from the cubs just chewing on them. I can see the babies are wanting, the, youngst, the youngest cubs are wanting to suckle now as well. So Jay Atkinson, uh, you've just commented on, on that interaction that we saw between the male and the female lion. And you said that maybe it was because the female got too close to the cubs that was with the male and that elicited that aggressive response. Um, how do I feel about that? Um, I don't think so. It's the, the cubs are really solely the responsibility of the, of the females to look after. And it's usually the females that have this aggressive reaction to the male. Let's see if 
I can deduce what's happening here. Potentially what happened was the, the female didn't want to be separated from the cubs by the male. Walked up behind the male. And maybe there was some subtle interaction there that I missed. And the female overstepped her boundary. And the male had to just assert his dominance over her. Not forgetting that the only reason why this male is tolerated around these females is, is because he is more dominant than what they are. Female lions will only mate with the most dominant male in the area. There's no allegiance to that male. There's just a submission. So there's no allegiance to this male, in which case they don't owe, they don't owe this male a kingdom of such. And Nancy, you've just commented that maybe he wants her to stay clear of the female that he wants to mate with. Possibly, he may have thought that it was just an, exactly, there may have just been a, a, a misunderstanding there. He thought he was being snuck upon from, from behind. Very possible that that's a, that's a reason there, Nancy. Um, yeah, just a weird reaction there. I mean, why that male would choose to do something like that. I mean, it wasn't aggressive. If you remember, he was quite up upright he's, he's, he was trying to stand as tall as he could over her that's just dominance that's not an attack I think what he did was he jumped at her she immediately went into submissive behavior which was lying on her side exposing her belly and her flanks like she did and being as low as what she can that was a submissive behavior I'm just going to have to make a little bit of space here so that Aubrey and Taxon can come in as well. We're going to have to squash a few vehicles in here. So I'm just going to move the car a little bit. They're lying in a place where we can literally only just see these three cubs. And you'll see, because of our careful nature around these cubs, we've got a vehicle approaching, and you will notice how little attention, firstly, the mother gives these cars, and that's, that's the important one. And then secondly, but just as importantly, these cubs, the next generation of adult lions that we'll have in this area, grow up not fearing cars. And it's because we behave in a very, very respectful way to these lions. You can see that they are noticing a 3,000 pound or 4,000 pound car arriving, but they're not scared. Is that good? <laughs> yeah. I've just had Texans say that there's, this is the only visual that he can see of these lions. They're lying literally on a bank that is almost inaccessible for, for vehicles. Now this time of year, as we've predicted, would happen the lions are literally camping next to these pans and they they're starting to do it because animals are getting desperate they they are literally moving kilometers between feeding areas and between between watering points and this Gallego pan is just one of those fantastic watering points that just attracts a vast amount of game in particular buffalo and these in Kahuma lions are buffalo specialists they really know how to kill buffalo And they're very good at it. And I think that is exactly why they are camping out at this pan. That male lion could do with a meal here. He, his dewlap was hanging on the bottom of his belly. His hips were sticking out. He's not, he's not in bad shape, but he needs some food. And I'm sure that these females haven't killed anything substantial in the last two or three days. They could also do with some food. 
Do you want me to go forward a bit more text? The, the female is lying under that quarry and the male has gone off the edge there. <laughs> Texan just shakes his head like he doesn't know <laughs> where he's lying. <laughs> uh, you'd never say there are 15 lions lying within 30 feet of where we are just looking at these two cubs. And, not one in three vehicles can actually see them, or all of them, I should say. All right, and while this cub disappears here into the bush and gives us a, what would seem to be the last glance of these particular cats today, um, I think it's a good time to go to Brent for an update, and we'll see if we can reposition in the meantime. What perfect timing! I was about to say we hadn't found anything and then look what's in the road. Hello Ellie's. Now oh, that little man looks like he might be full of mischief. <laughs> look at him holding his leg just off the ground, thinking about what to do next. Are we going to charge? Wherever he puts that front foot down next is going to be a... <laughs> oh, you're a silly boy. There we go. Hello, Mom. Oh, what's the matter with you, Mom? Uh-uh, it's okay. Good girl. Now uh, you saw that little bit of movement from her. She wasn't too happy with our presence. And I thought she might give us a warning rev at one stage. Fortunately, she didn't. So I'm not going to move. Yeah, she started feeding, so that's better. But there was just that little bit of body language had said she wasn't too happy. I actually thought she might give us a, as I said, a, a charge at the, as she crossed the road there. But fortunately she didn't. And there are going to be some quite stressed elephants in the drought, so you just have to be extra careful. Well, it seems like Elaine Cole, if you ask, you shall receive. So, you requested elephants and baby lions, and we've had both. Just move back a little bit. I'm just letting the engine run. I'm not trying to surprise her, so she knows I'm going to move. She knows where I am. But I'm just going to we might not stay here too long. I'm just going to judge her behavior a bit. You can see she is quite intently listening to us. It's okay. Okay, there we go. her tail swinging again. She's okay. Oh, it looks like these Ellie's all like to keep their, their foot dangling. And, oh, excuse me. Oh. Hopefully it's not an attack of the sneezes. And sometimes I get sneezing attacks that I, I sneeze so much I have to stop the car, I can't drive. Oof. She's behind some bush there and she isn't too relaxed. Let's just move again a little bit. Who's a new viewer? 
would like to know, how is there enough food for the elephants? Well, what happens now, which is actually quite good for the bush, they're forced to eat species that they wouldn't normally eat, like that weeping wattle she's eating at the moment. Sorry, excuse me one second, guys. <coughs> oh. There we go, there's a little one. And it looks like they're going to move off. So what happens in, in times of drought like this, they're forced to feed off of plant species they would normally eat, like wattle, weeping wattles. Uh, and, uh, oh, what do you got? There we go, that's a weeping wattle right next to us. So under normal circumstance, they probably wouldn't feed too much of that. Um, but they're also feeding quite a lot of monkey orange um, and terminalias, and that's stuff that they wouldn't normally feed off. So it is quite good for the bush, so because there's not a lot of nutrients in the other plants, they are diversifying their diet. Now, what this is going to do is going to open up uh, quite a few different areas. And, and when we do get rain, that means there's going to be more grass. So even though a lot of the animals are going to suffer now, in the long run, the drought could be quite beneficial, uh, which will increase our carrying capacity. So it's always better to have more grass than trees. Grass is more nutrient rich and also more, diff more species focus primarily on grass as their food source. So for example, in normal, normal, normal rains in the summer months, 80% uh, of an elephant's diet is in fact grass, not trees. So we are near the southern boundary now. Uh, I know Herbie seems to be tracking a mating pair of lions somewhere on Gwari Pan. So what we're going to do is, he's asked me to ch double check the southern boundary, see, fingers crossed, if Queen Karula has made her way back into our Travis area. On a very good note, and, and blah, 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 very good news, even though it might not sound like it, I think I'm definitely over the worst of my man flu. And it's been, uh, I, I, don't, I don't do well with flu. It seems to really, really hit me harder than malaria. I'd rather have malaria than flu. At least I know exactly how long since I take my tablets till the malaria is going to be gone. Uh, the flu is a bit of a, a conundrum to me but uh, definitely over the worst of it, so yay! Okay, so Kiwi Jane, who's a new viewer, is wondering what that is. Uh, that is a virtual reality rig. So it shoots video 360 degrees around us. Um, if you want to have a look at one of those, I think if you go onto YouTube and type in Safari Live, the naughty elephant, but you need to do it on a mobile device, not on a desktop. And if you have a tablet or an iPhone or something like that, and you can have a look at everything around us. So you can see what the cameraman's doing, you can see what the elephant's doing. So it's a virtual reality rig. Okay, so now we are on the southern boundary and I'm in search of tracks of Queen Karula and the, the cubs. is wondering when we are tracking animal paw prints on the ground does each individual animal have a very uh, different print they probably do but most uh, most of us we can tell you it's a lion a leopard a wild dog a hyena um, for example I, I i know karula's tracks very well because i've spent many many hours on her tracks and she's got particularly small tracks for a female leopard um, and then when it comes to the male leopards, we can normally guess who it is uh, just on where the area is. So they do have defined territories, but they do move out of those territories from time to time. But uh, for example, if we find tracks of a female leopard and two cubs on this road, we're almost 100% certain that it is Karula. Now, that is exactly what we're hoping to find paw prints of the Queen Karula.
Okay, so we're going to go very, very slowly down here. I'm going to have my eyes peeled to the ground. Uh, so while I do that, uh, let's go see how Steph is doing. Thanks, Brent. I'm doing fine, thank you. Um, so is Brian. We've just had a, we're just reminiscing over this lion sighting. We've had to leave um, because a lot of people are wanting to see the lions and we've had such a fantastic sighting so far that we made some space for another person to come in and have a look. Um, for those of you who don't know about the sightings or the restrictions around sightings, we have a maximum of three vehicles in a sighting if the terrain permits. We can go down to two vehicles or one vehicle, even no vehicles. Um, and then we cycle people through that three vehicle maximum, once again, as the sighting permits. So if animals move into a very thick block or into an area that's not safe to drive, then we can restrict that sighting. Um, but for now, they're just still on that embankment. They didn't move. We heard the male growl and grumble a little bit just as we left, but they didn't change positions at all. And my gut feel tells me that similar to the last three or four days or five or six days, I can't remember for how many consecutive days we've actually had the lions on this property. We, they might even camp out here for a little bit. Um, obviously the presence of the lions will be a deterrent for a lot of animals. And with the actual amount of fresh water that is available in the Sabi Sands, just through all the pumped pans, I've no doubt that the animals will start going to another dam and then at some point the lions will be forced to move. But in a completely natural system, in an area where they don't pump pans, uh, or have pans that are pumped very, very far apart, it's not uncommon for lions to spend weeks, eight, nine, ten weeks around a single water source. I remember quite fondly a couple of years back me following a lion pride that literally camped out for eight weeks around a drying up seep and would kill and eat right next to the water and animals would walk a couple of feet away from the lions feeding on one of their friends to drink water and then move away. Um, you know, necessity dictated that that's how they behave. It was just something really amazing to see. Alrighty, so what are we going to do for the rest of the morning? That is a good question. So Maura Lee, you've just asked me um, why if water is pumped to a pan, uh, why don't green things sprout nearby? Maura Lee, it's, got some, it's, it's simply to do with the amount of feet that walk to that dam. Literally nothing gets given a chance to even sprout and it gets trampled and stepped on. And compaction, with all the animals that come down to drink, they trample the area there to not quite a concrete, but much too hard for the sensitive plants to come through. Given time, weeds will break through. That's what they do. They break through that crust and aerate the soil and make it a lot easier for, uh, for other plants to come in and, uh, and colonize an area, basically. Um, but right now, just too much traffic and too much compaction. That'll obviously change as the year wears on and we get some rain coming about and puddles forming in, in abstract areas where animals have now been forced to leave because there's just no fresh water. Puddles will form there and because those areas still have a little bit of grazing left, hopefully they'll be the ones to recover first. So what happens here is it starts to rain and we have this mass exodus of animals. And I predict that although we've been very spoilt over the last couple of days, that that's going to change towards December, January and February where it becomes quite difficult to see large cats and animals here. Not only is it very very thick but just the general spreading out of animals across the entire park makes sightings few and far between. Andrew, all the way from Vermont, has asked me a question. What animal can tell when it's going to rain first? Ooh, um, 
The easy answer, Andrew, is that us. We have the, we have the brain power to do it and all the computer modeling, and we, we don't even get it right with all of that. But I'm gathering you asked about what animal indicators do it. And then I'm going to say that the Birchall's Kukul, for me, predicts up to a 70% chance of rain. So Birchall's Kukul calling, they make this lovely uh, um, wooding noise. I'm not even going to try and do that. Brent and James, it's there sole capacity to try and make funny animal noises <laughs> but they make a funny wooding noise a repetitive wooding noise and um, they are fine for me at least are about 70 percent accurate they can predict rain up to a 70 percent chance and I'll, I'll quite often use it to predict rain and of course only being wrong three times out of every ten times um, doesn't mean that you're always right, but it definitely gives me a sense of well-being. Commitment to my prediction, I suppose, is a better way of putting it. <laughs> Bill, you, uh, well, you just asked me, did my son like the yogurt spoon that I made him? And just for those of you who missed that particular show, I walked up to an apple leaf on a walk recently and broke off a piece of wood uh, where elephants had damaged the tree and during the course of the show I carved a wooden spoon uh, with my knife and then gifted it to my son as a yogurt spoon. He loves yogurt and with these small little tubs I thought that I'd give it to him. Uh, in all honesty he took one look at it, said thank you rubbed it on his lip like I asked him to just to appreciate the amount of work and effort that I put into it and then put it in his toy box and since then hasn't even used it once as far as I know he may have this week used it I told him it was for his yogurt I'm hoping that he does use it at some point he'll remember about it um, and I'll give it an, a decent amount of time and then I'll force him to use it just so that it can be used for that yogurt uh, remind me in a few weeks I'll keep you updated as to exactly what the outcome was I almost used it myself for some yogurt and then I thought, no, I wouldn't do it. I'd leave it for him. It's his spoon. <laughs> All right, I think I'm going to go past the Bifflesuk algae pond and see if that hippo has made it out there. And while I'm getting there, it would be a good time for Brent to give you an update about what he's been up to. Looks like Ben might have spotted a leopard track. It's hopefully it's not like his last leopard track, which was a hyena. Let's have a look. Have you got it, Ben? Well spotted, Ben. That is definitely a female leopard crossing in. Mm-hmm. Well done. Where did she go? So, ah, there's the tracks there. Okay, that's going to be better to see than these ones on this side. I'm just going to have a quick look and try to judge their age, because of course Karuna's up and down and around and backwards and forwards often in these parts. There we go. It's her front foot there, the bigger one. It's her back foot. So what I'm looking for now is to see if there's any little bird tracks or insect tracks on top. Let's have a look over here. Hoop, hoop, hoop. Oh, there's people tracks here, and that's another good indicator of the freshness of the tracks. See if they're not my footprints, but someone's footprints. See if they've actually stepped over. She's going more this way. So the reason it's difficult difficult to edge tracks on a road like this. 
is because it's a big access road, means there's a lot of traffic up and down it. So it might look like the tracks aren't fresh because of the dust of a car speeding past. That's why I just want to see, okay, we go here, here. She just go, does go straight after all. Here we go. Okay. They weren't here yesterday. But whether no, she's crossed early in the night and then crossed back. And no sign of the cubs as well. Well, let's just double check because they often scutter about. Stuck just here. But it looks like early last night. I don't think it was, it's very fresh from. Hello. This morning, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. That looked like a cub back. There's cars up and down, it's difficult. There's a cub track here as well. Okay, well let's head down towards Twin Dams and see if we pick up any tracks around there. Okay, mm -hmm. we've got something to follow up on. Hi, Tasha Michelle. Tasha Michelle is wondering, can a baboon kill a leopard? Most certainly they can, especially a leopard cub. A uh, baboon could probably kill Karula if a group of males ganged up. And a baboon has got canines that are longer than a male lion's. I'm just going to let all the other cars know that there's tracks of Karula crossing in. And Gonzo of Wansati Ingwe coming north about 200 meters to the west of Twin Dams and also Shami Van Love. Hello. Another lovely little herd of elephants. Now these ones, you can just see immediately from the body language, unlike the other one, absolutely not a care in the world about us. What are you up to, little one? Oh, Andrew's wondering how friendly can an elephant get? Uh, well, they can get very friendly, but we never let them get too friendly. Uh, if they get too close, I just tap the side of the car. If it looks like they might smell VM or myself or put their trunk into the car, because they're probably not gonna do anything to us, but there's always that chance that something could go wrong and that's dangerous for us and it's dangerous for the animal. Hey mom. Look at that. Sniffing. <coughs> Now, Felicity in New Zealand is wondering what we can tell from the elephant by the way they hold their tail. Now, if we look at this one's tail, it's completely limp, hanging around, might swing a bit, and it means completely relaxed. When they are not relaxed, they get a little stiffness to their tail. When they're very upset, their tail actually sort of sticks out and is completely rigid. Yum, 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 some dry combritum leaves for me. Here comes another one. I think there are going to be a lot of elephants around today. I've just got that feeling. Let's go back a little bit. A 
I love little trouble. Hello, little monster. Oh, you're so big and scary and brave. Yes, off you walk. And that lovely little female. Here comes the next one, Liam. Hello. Yes. Hello. I do love elephants. So this is how friendly elephants can get. Oh, yes. It's very scary. Now that head shake is just a reminder that they're big and strong. But again, looking at her body language, it's telling me that she's just more inquisitive. She's not very serious about doing us any harm. Uh, more worried about the stick in her mouth. Hey, give us a sniff. Here we go. <coughs> oh, sorry, guys. Yeah, we're going to let these ellies move on and uh, we're going to go across to Steph who's got some magnificent truffle legged at the Buffalo's Hook water hole. Welcome back. I do indeed have some truffle legged or whatever Brent said there. <laughs> some kudu to us mere mortals. Um, it seems to be a fairly large herd actually. That's not a full grown male, that's a youngster. He's still with his natal herd, i.e. with his mom. Uh, and Paula have just gotten a fright from a monkey that's jumped into a tree and that's what's caused that kudu to lift her tail like that. That fluffy under tail that you saw there was the following mechanism that a kudu's baby would follow if she had to dash into the bush. They follow that white blaze. You can see there's just a a lot of impala and kudu and everything around here. Some of the kudu have got these muddy socks on them from having st stood or walked out into the mud to get a mouthful of water at the Buffalo's Hook Wallow. It's not really a dam at the moment. It's just a big pit with some mud in the bottom. I think that's pretty much exactly what it is. <laughs> I can't wait for this to be full of water. I think it's going to be the most beautiful sight, to be quite honest. Now, I think what gave those impala a fright, which in turn gave their kudu a fright, was a monkey, a vivid monkey, that is just sitting in the tree there. And I'm wanting to see if we can get a view of it. Let's go forward a little bit. Hi. Uh, <laughs> thank you. you I am. Thank you. <laughs> right. Sorry about that. We just got distracted there by a uh, another vehicle that has what happened to see me doing some fill-in work for James and Jamie along the weeks and paying me a compliment, which of course we have to say thank you to. It's nice being given compliments. All right, that monkey is in this tree, he's hiding. So I don't know, he's in, that, in, the, in the tree in the middle where you got him, Brian, up on the left-hand side. There he goes there. Whoop, boom. Yes, see, that was pretty good. This was, I'm sure, the monkey that we saw last night sitting in that tree enjoying the sunset. Yeah, see, how was that jump? Wow! Did you get that, Brian? That was easily a 9 or 12 foot drop from the, from the tree onto the floor. That's incredible, actually. And now they're all moving off. I think the monkeys and the vervets have this sort of relationship with one another where the, um, the
the monkeys knock down leaves and seed pods from the trees and the impala then come and feed off of that. Impala then also are super vigilant and allow the, allow the monkeys an added protection barrier. So it would give sort of pre-warning if there was a leopard or something around. So they help one another like that. It's called commensalism is the term where one party helps and an, helps another party and another part they help with one another where both parties benefit from the relationship with one another i've all moved off into that thicket now i can't actually see impala or monkeys once again you'd never see if you drove by here right now you'd have driven past here thinking there was nothing here and yet there's probably about 30 impala in there and at least five vivid monkeys. Yeah, I can see an impala in the shadows there. Not much else. The rest of Bivolzook is unfortunately virtually dry. The hippo has moved on so he didn't get stuck. I don't quite know how I feel about that. I'm glad he didn't get stuck, let me just say that. Let's now go and see what birds come down here. So EPAC has just asked me what is the most endangered species we have in the area and you're a new viewer. So firstly, I just want to welcome you to the Wild Earth family. Welcome to Safari Live and welcome to the... To the most epic safari vehicle on the planet as far as I'm concerned so congratulations thank you very much for sending in your comment and your question and now let me get to answering it so the most endangered species of large ma of, of, of animal in South Africa is an animal called the golden mole and the golden moles probably fill the first couple of positions on the mo most critically endangered but because the golden moles are not cute and cuddly I think they don't uh, they don't ha hold such a fantastic place in our minds and so one of the best examples of a, of a, of a uh, patriot for endangered species is the African wild dog and the cheetah. Um, black rhinoceros would probably be the three that for me hold the top spots there. So the African wild dog or the painted wolf, uh, the cheetah and the black rhino are all sitting at just a couple of hundred individuals uh, in South Africa alone and probably not more than a thousand, couple of thousand individuals worldwide today. And they are sort of the patriots, the pioneers of, this, uh, of these endangered species. All right, but Brent has got a bird, and before it flies away, I think go there and see what it is. Oh, there's a beautiful little orange-breasted bushrike hopping around. So we've come down into the Mawati to do a bit of birding because the last time we went birding, um, we, might, we might up a bit, Ben. He hopped. Oh. Here he is. Such a beautiful bird. A very distinct call. Birdie from Georgia says, yes, bird time. Yes, Birdie, I also enjoy a good bit about of birding. And I'm really searching for this white-throated robin. Okay, well, let's keep moving. Now, this is a good time of the morning. It's warmed up a little bit. It's a great time in the morning to be birding around the Mawati. And, of course, it's not only the birds that are enjoying this part of the world at the moment. And look who's just walked into, in, into sight. Hello, big boy. He keeps moving behind the bush. It's a nice big male in Yala. Now we've seen Kudu with Steph. This is the second member of the Trafalagid family that we get here. Now, who knows? Maybe we will even get all three. The third being my favorite antelope at Juma, the bushbuck. Hey, mister.
Love the little white chevron on his schnoz. There we go. Having a good scratch. I'm just trying to see if we can hear a crested barbet calling. But with that skulking little bush right around, I'm hoping the skulking white throated robin is here too. Okay, let's keep cruising the Mawati riverbed. Now, Joey in Australia says he thinks he can see a Warburg's eagle on the Juma cam. Can I give him a few ways to help identify? Okay, so with the Warburg's, Joey, quite often they have a little crest on their head that sticks out. Um, I forgot my iPad this morning, but I think I'll have a picture on here. Uh, another good way, Joey, is they've got a very straight tail. So it's a very straight angular tail. And of course, you get pale morphs and dark morphs uh, of the Warburg's eagle. There we go. So there's a pale morph, but they often have that little crest. Let me just have a look if I got a picture of a dark morph. I don't have to turn it around here. So there's a dark morph. Um, so it's pale, dark, and intermediate. So, and again, I'm just trying to see if they've got, see what I said, very square, square tail. Now, compared to the other eagles, they're quite small. So it's very possible. I know James has seen one recently. Hopefully it's still there. We're going to cruise the Moati all the way towards um, the dam cam, but just while we've got our birders out here, on the, what have you got for him? On, on the ground. There we go. There we go, down there where my finger is. Some crested Franklins. Fossicking about, looking for breakfast. Excuse me. Oh, what track's that there, man? Ah, oh, it is a civet. A civet sneaking in the Moati. This is another good spot for birds. <laughs> Hi, William. William says a bunch of us guys sneak into uh, his room to watch Safari Live on YouTube if they ever get caught by the nurses in the nursing homes. Uh, they'll be in big trouble. So, William, I think what you should do if you ever get caught just start whooping at the nurses like a hyena. I don't think the nurses will know what to do. Or you could roar at them like a male lion. All birds. Here we go. I thought we might get some nice little birds around here. Oh, don't fly. 
Is it, is it, it, is it our nemesis? It is not. And you got him there, Vim. That's a difficult, well, yeah, you do, well done, Vim. It is a robin indeed, but not the robin I was looking for. I've been searching for the white-throated robin. This is the white-browed scrub robin. Come on, out from behind the stick, please. You're going to be famous now, little Robin. Oh, here we go. Oh, now, a little flitting, skulking species, but a beautiful species nonetheless. Now, where's your cousin of a beautiful white-throated Robin that we, I think I've only managed to get on camera once? So I got quite excited because they move quite similarly, the scrub robins and white-throated robins. But while we keep searching for the elusive white-throated robin, uh, let's go across to Steph, who's got an animal that has two of the same colors as uh, the robin, uh, black and white. But before we do that, just going to give you a quick squiz through the gap at someone who's watching us. A big male giraffe peering down at us in the Mawati River with an ox pecker between his horns or between his ears and his horn. Oh, quite a few ox peckers on him. Looks to be red bulled ox peckers. It looks like that giraffe is just basking in the morning sun. Well, it looks like the black and white creatures with Steph have disappeared, so you're going to sit with us in this big male giraffe. Now, look at that big bump on his forehead. Now, they've got a thickened skull around that area, and they do use their heads for fighting. You can see lots of scars, and they really swing those long necks and create quite a lot of momentum. They're just sitting in the morning sun, looking down. And that's unfortunately what the VM will show you now. There's no way for us to get any closer to him as there's a large bank in our way. Now, this is an old, old giraffe bull. You can see that by the darkening. Uh, of his skin, as well as just all the scars and whatnot on his, on his face and that large protrusion. It looks like he's going to move along. Oh, hello, big man. And it's definitely one of the giraffe we see quite regularly around Juma. And uh, he disappears into a thicket. So, uh, let's go see uh, how Steph's doing. Unfortunately, uh, the striped donkeys have uh, disappeared. My striped donkeys have disappeared. Uh, thanks to Brent's brilliant giraffe finding skills. But uh, we're on Cheetah Cut Line at the moment. It's just such a nice road. I quite enjoy coming down this road. I know Scott used to hate it because it was just so dead straight with nothing else to look at in front of him. But I quite enjoy this particular road. It's got beautiful sand for tracking on. And very often we find animals crisscrossing across here. So it's a good place to see what has entered and what has exited Juma from Torchwood. And on the other side of Torchwood is, of course, the Kruger National Park. So it's always got this wild feel to it. Nice big marula tree. And we're also on a crest here, which is also nice. It adds an aspect. Ah, here we've got a water buck and a calf. Fuzzy little water buck calf. We see these water buck quite often. Have a look at that baby looking over his shoulder at us. <laughs> so 
So James, James Richard, you just um, you've you've heard a story or read something that says that kudu is are, are susceptible, highly susceptible to rabies, and you wanted to know uh, are there any other animals that are highly susceptible to radi rabies? Excuse me, rabies. Um, yes, there is lots of accounts of kudu having rabies or being rabid, um, but it's. It's true for all the antelope. Kudu in just some areas are, are the most abundant antelope. And when a kudu has rabies, quite often they walk quite boldly into camps, um, which of course is unusual and what makes headlines. Um, but almost any animal can catch rabies. You do have vectors for rabies. It tends to be small mammals that live in communities with one another. Bats are a vector for rabies. Mongoose are, are a vector for rabies. And a vector means they can carry it without them dying and then spread it. And they spread through contact with one another. Through saliva, in actual fact, saliva that breaks the skin. So quite often the rabies, I think it's a virus. I'm not too sure, I can't really remember. I think rabies is a virus, but it attacks the brain, causes the brain to overheat. And of course, when a brain overheats, it, short, it, it shorts out basically and creates these behavioral changes. And in predators, it makes them quite snappy and overly aggressive, and they bite other things, and that then passes on the rabies virus. In this particular area, this is a rabies prone area. We do get rabies here. So any antelope that we find that is unusually bold is to be treated as a rabies risk. And then obviously any, uh, any predator that, that has unusually high aggression levels is also to be treated with much caution. Now we had a huge rabies outbreak here last year and it almost completely decimated the jackal population. Um, whereas before the rabies broke out in about June, July last year we were hearing, actually it was before July, it was about May, June, we were hearing jackals at my house all the time and literally from July to maybe May this year I didn't hear another single jackal. It took that long for jackals to sort of recover for new puppies born to the few jackal that survived this pandemic to then mature enough so that they started to call again. And I must be honest, it's something that I stress about all the time with my young boy who plays outside all day. But you know, not worse than, I suppose, a bad education or not having food that day. <laughs> Shamsung, you've asked if uh, rabies could be contracted if an animal to kill and eat, eat a rabid animal. Uh, Shamsung, as, as far as I understand, the only way to contract rabies is through being bitten. So not ingested, but actually injected. Um, and where there is saliva involved. So unless an animal was killed and in, the, in its dying managed to turn around and bite whatever was killing it, I don't think so. However... I have this niggle in the back of my memory that's telling me that if you eat the brain of an infected uh, animal, you can actually pick up the virus. I don't have any reference material with me right now, Shamsung, to actually confirm rabies with you, to be honest. And I'm probably going to, for that reason, ask one of, one of us, one of the viewers here, one of you, to help me with this so that I can help everybody else. Um, and just to give a quick overview of rabies... Um, how it's spread and can you can you actually contract it through other means than being bitten and where you have saliva injected into you that's my limited understanding of rabies um, you're welcome obviously sending your questions via email through that questions at wildearth.tv email address or through the hashtag safari live on twitter and uh, if there's time and if we have an answer i'll share it Now this little water bucket, you'd think that they get hot with that fur on, but in actual fact, 
that fur that they've got there is very oily and it's designed solely to shed water off of their, their coats. Very similar to the tassels on a leather jacket um, were designed to draw water away from le the leather and to actually make it easier to dry leather off. The fur on a water buck coupled with the oil that it secretes from its skin then dries the skin of the water buck off and allows it to stay a bit warmer for a bit longer. Of course out here I think being dressed in a woolly blanket like that would be uncomfortable to say the least between October and April. This little water buck calf taking note of its surroundings. So Chloe, all the way from Illinois, hello, you've um, asked me what my favorite antelope is. Let me think, Chloe. Um, the first one that comes to mind has to be sable. I mean, they're just so dramatically magnificent. Um, and also because we don't see them that often. When you do see one, it's quite special. A large male kudu is also quite a magnificent being. Um, Nyala, of course, I mean, we... we we saturated with Nyala here, but in actual fact, if you think about how beautiful a Nyala bull is, it makes it hard to ignore. And then, of course, just the majesty of, say, a, a, a really big waterbuck bull with the huge muscles that they get and those, that erect posture with, the, with their big, robust horns. Let me see, which one of them are my favorite? Which one's yours, Brian? I'd have to also say Sable. So Brian, who's actually spent much time in the Kalahari where he was also saturated by sable, has this lingering feeling that for him sable are the most magnificent. For me, I think the top spot is, is shared between a large male kudu and a sable, I would imagine, and probably an oryx. Oh, that's a three-way tie there. And I know we all hate ties. So oryx, large male kudu, or a sable. Those would be my three choices. Which one did you choose out of that? Still the sable, eh? Brian? Mm, I would have to say sable simply because I've seen sable battling it out on foot. And ah. It was absolutely phenomenal. And Brian's attached an emotional memory to his decision. He said that he's seen sable fighting on foot and just that and their, their picture, their, their, their bodies, their physiology is what for him makes a sable the most impressive. I still remain undecided to be honest. An oryx, sable or greater kudu, all males have to be my favorite out of all the antelope. <laughs> Chloe, I hope that answers your question and makes it a bit easier. <laughs> or answer your question with a no answer and yak a lot. They moved off and I think it's also time for us to move on and see what else we can find in the last few minutes of this magnificent safari. We've got a Birchill starling in the road in front of us. Let's see if we can get a little bit closer. I know we're wanting to send you over to Brent to see what he's been up to. But since Brent stole my zebra from me, I'm going to steal his update from him by showing you a Birchill starling that will no doubt fly away. Birch's starling are insectivorous birds. They run around on those long legs of theirs looking for insects on the ground. And they have the most beautiful feathers. Let's see if we can get a little bit closer to him and see. Every now and again you'll get that iridescence that comes off his head. There he goes. Look at that. Oh, that's pretty. Almost got that green sheen on the front of their shoulder. And then it goes to sort of a purpley color down their wings and on their, on, their, on their bottoms, on their vents as it's called, on their bums, and then on their head. This one is just picking up termite after termite after termite, shoveling them in. Now from this angle, the bird looks pitch black, and that's because its feathers are actually pitch black. They're covered in a thick layer of keratin which allows for light to refract as it's going through the keratin layer, which gives them that iridescence. And different layers and thicknesses of keratin give them the different colors or the different refractions. Here he's turning now. We should be able to get that sheen. There we go. 
lacks the orange eye of the blue-eared starling and is a little bit larger than the blue-eared starling. And just a magnificent family of birds, the starlings that occur here. We get the violet-backed starling that will come back in December, which for me is probably the most striking bird that arrives, is this violet-backed starling. That is nice. All right. And I think after that, we are now at a point where we can go back to Brent and go and see what he's been up to in the last couple of minutes. <laughs> We're still on the birding mission. I decided to come look to see if we can find that possible warbird's eagle around the Juma Dam. Are you, have you got your eyes open, Vim? Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm looking in all the prominent trees, especially the dead ones, because that's where large birds of prey normally like to sit. Hi, Steve. Steve's wondering, are there any birds that resemble crows or ravens in the area? Yes, Steve actually saw a pied crow yesterday flying overhead. So there are, and they are indigenous. We've got quite a few different crow or raven species uh, in southern Africa. Having a look carefully, I can't see this eagle just yet. But I do see some other lovely birds around, so let's have a look. Some of them are flying. <coughs> come on, fly closer to us. There we go, here they are. See them, Vim. I'm going to try and get us in a spot where I think they're going to fly very close to us. Okay, they might come around now. Oh, dwarf mongoose as well. Scuttling across the road. Well, let's move a bit forward. Maybe we get a nice view of the mongoose. Hello, little horrors. All over here, little dwarf mongoose scuttling about. That looks like a, a, a youngster. Oh, so there's, there's an adult there. Now there are two youngsters I saw. There's one. Little busy bodies foraging away. Oh, Vim, there's a baby one quite close to us here on the edge of this. And there, there he is. Digging, what have you found? Oh, digging, digging, digging. Oh, got something. I'm sure they're quite happy that whatever the eagle was is not around anymore. Oh, hello, guys. So I'm just going to chat to Herbie quickly. Standing by. Copy, uh, I thought so. Thanks, Herb. See, something spooked them. Was it a, a shadow in the sky of a bird of prey? I think they got a fright from a, a go-away bird. Is that a go-away bird on top? It's very silhouetted there that just landed. And it pays to be overcautious when you're that size. 
There's quite a lot. I'll just move back a bit. There's quite a lot of activity happening around those ones there. Looks like they might even be marking territory. There's lots of, lots of them there. All clustered around the spot. Smelling something intensely on that branch. Ah, oh, there we go. There's a scent mark. Yeah, so they're all scent marking. So all members of uh, the family group will scent mark. And as you can see, it's quite a social affair scent marking. <laughs> so cute. So they live in, oh there we go, using the anal gland, scent mark, scent mark. Well there comes one of the little ones, about to hop in from the left. <laughs> so a big scent marking display going on here. Now Andrew's wondering, have we ever seen meerkats here? Unfortunately not Andrew, they don't occur here. We get dwarf mongoose, which is the ones we're looking at at the moment, and banded mongoose, a slightly bigger species. Meerkats occur in the more arid south and western sections. There we go, there's a little one. But I do see some nice birds at the pan, so we'll leave the mongoose to their morning and uh, go have a look. I think it was Joanne who was wondering, do we get shoe bulls here? Uh, we don't at all, Joanne. Um, the closest place. Ah, so I know a lot of you were lucky enough to see that serval on the Juma Cam, Joanne, I will be back with you in a second, but it's not often we get to see serval tracks. I think this is probably only the second time. The last time was on Bushwalk that I showed you serval tracks, and we actually tried to track that serval. We lost it after about a kilometer of following those tracks. Which is going to be the easiest one of these, Vim? This one. So there we go. Beautiful serval track. You can see one, two, three lobes at the back. See, it's a slightly different shape to a leopard track. Now that is a back foot, and there's the slightly bigger front foot, and you can see it's wider as well. So cool. Why did they drink during the day when we can see them? But we have seen a few servals on the live drive, but it's definitely not one of the creatures we see too often. Sorry, Joanne. Uh, Joanne was wondering about shoe bulls. No, we don't get shoe bulls here. Um, the closest shoe bulls to here are in northern Zambia, probably about 2,000 kilometers away in the Benguelu area. I've, I've lucky enough, I've seen shoe bulls in Benguelu and I've actually seen them uh, in Uganda off Lake Victoria. Okay, now let's have a look. There were some birds drinking at the pan. I think they might have moved off. We got distracted by the mongoose and the serval tracks. Oh dear, looks like they've all flown away. Just have a quick look, you never know. And all the birds that I was coming on my way to see have disappeared. All we got is a blacksmith lapwing. Okay, I'm going to continue to look for more interesting birds before the end of the show. Uh, while we do that, let's go see what Steph's up to. I'm up to driving down my favourite road here at Juma, one of my favourite roads, let me put it to you this way. And I like it for two reasons. One is that the end of the road, or the bottom part of the road, snakes its way through some thick bush, and I like that sort of thing. 
there's always the chance of seeing some little small creepy creepy thing and um and secondly, it's because I have a nice memory attached to an elephant encounter I had here with Scott on foot. It was one of my first times that I was in front of the camera and um, we ended up finding an elephant next to the road that we, we, we followed into the bush and found him on the edge of a drainage line here. And he then completely was oblivious of us and then all of a sudden changed direction and walked straight up to us and we had a bit of a stare down where I spoke nicely to him and then he left us alone. He just wanted to come and see what we were and what the disturbance was and he carried on with his day and we carried on with ours. But it was just, so it was a nice, a nice feeling, a nice sighting, no negative reactions whatsoever. And um, so yes, that I have a nice feeling generated around this road. So you're joining us going down the road basically. Ah, so Bud and Bushmom have given us an answer on the rabies question that we had. So thank you firstly for helping me to expand my knowledge and secondly for sharing all of this. So you've sent in two answers. One is it's, shed, uh, it's um, transmitted, it's a virus that's transmitted through saliva which we, we knew already. But secondly it's also transmitted through the brain's membrane. So by ingesting the brain's membrane you can actually contract uh, rabies as well. So thank you very much for that. So two ways. The one that we knew fairly common, you need to be bitten by something that breaks the skin and injects saliva, but you can actually get it from ingesting the membrane of a brain. So it would make sense that a predator can get it, uh, then this is just to go right back to the original question, it will make sense that a predator that catches an animal with rabies and eats its brain will also be able to get uh, rabies without that animal having to bite it and injecting saliva, which is interesting, eh? Scary these things, I'll tell you. These little viruses and things that run around here. Ah, so Birdie, all the way from Georgia, has just commented as well on the rabies thing that one of her chickens killed and ate a rat once and didn't get rabies, and that's because birds apparently can't get rabies. I suppose it makes sense. Um, birds are not mammals and they have a different physiology and a different chemistry and perhaps the virus that is rabies can't survive with that particular chemistry. Makes 100% sense, possibly, you know, it's, it's very possible. So thanks for that Birdie, that's actually quite nice information. Yeah, we're in the thick part, yeah. Um, Susan, you've just asked if there's any attempt to control the rabies on the property. Um, not in the Kruger National Park. Rabies is just one of those things that just sort of is endemic to an area. It's not, you don't have mass breakouts here. You just have animals that are infected with it. Similar to how rabies has been doing it for thousands upon hundred thousands of years. It's an organism that lives in harmony with the animals around it. Um, if it ended up killing everything, it would die itself, and so it doesn't. So while you do have quite intense breakouts in very localized areas, it's usually very short-lived, um, and things reset themselves in an area fairly quickly. Um, so the, the, the question that you asked was, do we have any control measures here? And so no is the answer in the Kruger National Park. There's no control measures for rabies. Uh, outside of the park where people live and are more susceptible to being bitten by rabid dogs and by rabid animals, yes, there is action there. And it's usually an inoculation, first of animals. So South Africa does a free rabies inoculation for all pets. If you want your animal in, in a rabbit in a, in a rabies area, the government actually pays to have your animals inoculated against rabies. You can be vaccinated against it. And then, secondly, if it gets too bad, I have heard of schools inoculating kids against rabies, which you can do as well. You can inoculate people against rabies. In actual fact, as far as I know, I think Brent and Jamie are both inoculated against rabies. Brent, I seem to remember a series of injections Brent gave himself and Jamie last year when rabies was quite bad or we had a breakout here. And he is immune to rabies at the moment, or should be at least. 
actually Brent is immune to most things, I think. Uh, so yes, there are actions taken outside of the game reserves, but inside the game reserves, no, no actions are taken. No actions are needed. Um, rabies is one of those things that is as, as negative as what it is as a disease. It, it's under the Kruger National Park's curatorship. They are here to make sure that all biodiversity is protected, not just the pretty ones. And although there's no massive conservation effort for rabies, <laughs> it's not what I'm saying, um, there's also no, no need to try and stop it or to try and control it in an, any massive area. Alrighty, in the four minutes that's left of drive here, I just want to see how close this tree wisteria is to flowering. That might help us with our predictions to the weeping boar bean mystery. So the, the tree wisteria is that tree there. The tall one that you've got, there you go. That is a tree wisteria and should be coming out in these bunches of purple flowers in the next couple of weeks. And I'm just busy looking to see if I can see any flower droops already hanging ready to open and I see none on that particular tree. Not even one in actual fact. So it would seem that we are still far away from having all the flowers and it's just the knob thorns in some other acacias. I saw a fever tree in Juma flowering yesterday so it would just seem like the acacias are flowering early this year, nothing else. All right. Now uh, we've reached that time of the day when myself and Brian have to bid you farewell. So wherever you are in the world, I hope that you have a fantastic day or have had a fantastic day and have a fantastic night. Thank you once again for all your support and all your questions and comments. And we will see you this afternoon at 3 o'clock Central Africa time. Have a nice day. We're just trying to find you one or two more birds before the end of drive. I heard a nice bird. No, I can't see it. Must have flattened off. Okay. Well, lovely to spend some time with the Inkahumas and Cubs with Steph this morning. And uh, unfortunately, the wild dogs were too quick for VM and I this morning. So I know it's a little bit, but at least I got to see them very early uh, as I was on my way across. But uh, I no more birds, and the white-throated robin still continues to elude. Um, Anna Marie says she's looking forward to Killer Bee Day tomorrow. Anna Marie, I think you've. You're, what's the date today, Vim? 26th, I think. Is it 26th or 27th today? Oh, so it is Killer Bee Day today. I've lost the day. I thought it was the. Uh, Move him. There it goes. 28th is Killer Bee Day, so it is tomorrow. Yes, I'm very excited for Killer Bee Day. And uh, we've got lots and fun, lots and lots of fun in store for you. Now, where did that butterfly go? It has escaped us like all the birds. But it's going to be a very exciting sunset safari. Lots of different things to look for. And I'm sure the Inkahumas are going to be around. And I, I've just got a feeling there's going to be a lot of elephants around today. Keep an eye on the pans. I think it's going to get really hot today. I think those ellies are going to need that water. So I definitely keep an eye on the Juma pan. And I'm really looking forward to spending some time with Eddies. And you never know, Queen Karula might move through during the day after that traumatic experience with baboons yesterday. So hopefully she decides Juma is a safer spot. And I don't think those Ngormas ate last night, so there could be a hunt on the cards this evening as well. So lots to look forward to. And uh, VM and I are going to say goodbye and see you in a few hours for the Sunset Safari.